Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 214, Meeples and Memories, celebrating half a decade of Tabletop Bellhop. Still going strong, I'm Sean, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge helping you make your game nights better. Well, we record this show live on Twitch Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love when our fans join us for any of our episode recordings. So just in case this happens to be your first time ever listening to us, this is a special episode. Uh, This is not going to follow our usual format and probably going to be a little loosey-goosey compared to usual. Not that we're ever all really that professional. Now, the reason it's a special episode is we are celebrating our five-year anniversary or birthday or whatever you call it when a podcast has been going for five years. Our first ever episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, which back then was just called Tabletop Bellhop Live, was recorded on the 26th of July, 2018, five years ago today. And tonight is all about celebrating that pretty arbitrary milestone. For tonight's celebration, we're going to mix things up a bit. We're actually going to start off with a couple of quick reviews. Mm -hmm. First up, a preview of the latest puzzle box from Escape Welt we wanted to talk about while the box is still live on Kickstarter. Second, another holiday hijinks game. This time, the birthday burglary, which we thought would fit in well with tonight's episode. Plus, we didn't want the uh, pile of shame to keep building up and not put out some reviews, because if you saw what we brought back from Origins, you know we've got a lot to get to. Now, after that, things are going to be pretty freeform. Uh, We're going to spend some time reminiscing about the last five years, talking a bit about the future, and then we've got some great questions and topics that came in from our Tabletop Bellhop Discord, discord discord.tabletopbellhop.com. We're going to want to get to those, and then we'll also be opening up things for those folk here live in the lobby on Twitch. Now, since this is a party, you can also expect some prizes, as well as an announcement for our next giveaway, which won't rival the size of our 200th episode giveaway, but will be a bit more personal to us. Now, for those door prizes, we will be asking some tabletop bellhop trivia, And the first person to answer correctly in the chat room will get a choice of one of a number of cool promos, tabletop day exclusives, free RPG things, and other small, easy-to-ship items. Now, winners will be contacted by our our editor and moderator, Deanna, better known as And She Games. So watch your Twitch direct messages if you answer questions correctly and we tell you you've won you will get a message from Deanna who will give you a link to a post we put up on the blog listing everything you can win. All right, well, why don't we get things started with a pretty simple one. For anyone who's listened to the show for more than a couple of months, what city did I last live in before returning to Windsor? Tech 2674 gets the first pick of the door prizes. One more note for those listening or watching at home, remember that you can find detailed show notes, including links to the games we mentioned, some of which may be affiliate links that help support this show. And you can find those at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 214. Also, many of the games we've mentioned tonight are games that we received as review copies from publishers. All right, let's start off with our first review, or I should say preview. Welcome to a spoiler-free early look at The Quest Tower, the latest wooden puzzle from Escape World. We have to thank for sending us a prototype preview copy of this puzzle and for being affiliates. You can find an affiliate link for the current Kickstarter in the show notes. So since it's been a bit since we've talked about one of Escape World's boxes, here's a reminder of who they are. They started as a physical escape room company in Germany and shifted to making wooden puzzles to survive the pandemic. We've reviewed a number of these in the past, including House of the Dragon, the Fort Knox box, the Quest Pyramid, and the Space Box. Find those reviews on YouTube and or the blog. Now, the Quest Tower is the latest wooden puzzle box from Escape Welt that's currently live right now on Kickstarter. Now, it has totally blown past its funding. I don't even know the percentage, two, 300% past. And this is the third wooden puzzle that Escape Welt has Kickstarted. So I know some people are a little leery of Kickstarter and, and, you know, buyer beware and everything, but I don't think there's any worry about backers getting what they pay for if you back this one. Now, before we go further, I need to make it clear that the copy of the Quest Tower Mo received is technically a prototype. Mm -hmm. As you can see in our Quest Tower unboxing video on YouTube, 
it didn't even show up in its own box, and we're not even sure if the retail packaging for this puzzle is complete yet. Now, due to being a prototype, it's possible something, or even quite a few things on this puzzle, may change by the time the Kickstarter is completed, shipped to backers, and later ends up in retail outlets around the world. Now, I will say, unlike at least one of their previous puzzles that did have some mistakes on the Kickstarter version that were fixed in later production. So when it, when people got their finished puzzle, it was fixed. There didn't appear to be any issues like that on this one. I have a feeling what I got to play with is what you're going to get to play with once it does ship. Now, this escape box is the largest, most detailed, and most difficult wooden puzzle that Escape World has created. It stands over six inches tall, and has a bottom diameter of over five inches. Now the secret space you're trying to unlock is about two inches square, though it's, it's actually hexagonal. Uh, large enough to put a small gift inside, but it wouldn't fit, say, like a gift card. The tower has a Mesopotamian theme and is inspired by the Tower of Babel. Note, inspired by is the key here. This wooden puzzle box is more of a fantastical interpretation of the famous tower with its own backstory, which you can read on the Kickstarter page, and which I'm sure will be included in the final puzzle in some way. Now, of all the puzzles Escape Vault has produced, this one has the most steps to complete. The designers listed as taking up to two hours complete, which is double the time of their existing puzzles, with a difficulty of five out of five, and I can't argue those numbers. Now, one thing that shocked me when Mo was sharing picks after he got it open was the amount of deconstruction and extra bits that came off this puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in, in this puzzle. I want to say this box. I guess the box. Now, just to highlight how complex this puzzle is. So I got the box. I unpackaged it live, uh, recorded that. We ended up putting that up. But a couple days later, I got an email from um, my, com my, my contact at Escape Vault, who's like, in case you're having difficulty with the puzzle, here's a PDF to help you. This was 13 pages long. A 13-page step-by-step -step guide with two steps per page on how to get the Twest Tower open. Now, I didn't actually need it to get it open, but it did tell me how I should have solved some of the steps in the puzzle that I ended up getting through trial and error and touch and feel. Like all of the Escape Welt puzzles, while you can lockpick your way through at least some of the puzzles, there is a logical step-by-step -step way to solve the puzzle based on the information presented on the puzzle itself without having to rely on your sense of touch or undue force. Now, one thing I'm not sure I agree with on the Kickstarter page is that it's listed as a collaborative game for up to four players. And I don't know where they got that number from. Like, it just seems arbitrary. They're like, I don't know, most people like four player games or most game groups are four players because the entire thing's just one puzzle and really only one person can work on it at a time. Well, yes, you're probably going to end up passing the puzzle back and forth between a few people or leaving it on a table and having people fiddle with it. And it's likely you're going to need more than one perspective to get the box open. For example, I would have never gotten my copy open without Deanna's help. But I can't see a reason for a four-player specific limitation. I found that a little odd. Now, another thing I noted was that the final prize, the Scroll of Wisdom, was cooler than some of the prizes you found at the center of other Escape Wealth boxes. Yeah, and I agree on that. <laughs> well, I guess the real question at this point is, should our listeners consider backing this later kicks, uh, this latest Escape Welt Kickstarter? So the most important thing that you need to know if you're considering backing this is the fact that, as we've already mentioned, this is not easy. This is a difficult puzzle. Now, I'm quite proud of myself for getting this one open in about the two-hour time limit. It was a bit over. But that was with the help from Deanna, who caught a cue part of the puzzle I completely and totally missed. In addition to this, I also got it open due to using trial and error and just fiddling to solve a couple parts of the puzzle. Had I not just fiddled around with things and, until they worked and things opened and things moved, I'm sure it would have taken me way longer. Like, I know this since once I did have it open, I tried to work things backwards. I tried to reverse engineer it and go, well, why did I have to put this in this position to this to open? And I never did figure out what's actually the second step of the puzzle. It wasn't until I got that PDF from the publisher that I mentioned that I learned just how you were supposed to solve that part of the box. So if I had went, no, I'm not going to fiddle with it. I'm going to logic this out. I think that would still be sealed in front of me, and we probably wouldn't be reviewing this tonight. The other thing that's worth noting is that this isn't your first Escape Welt puzzle. At no. this point, you've already solved four of Escape Welt's other puzzles, which includes one that you had to build yourself. 
getting to see the inner workings and engineering that goes into these boxes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call myself a wooden puzzle expert at this point, but I do have a good idea of the type of stuff that Escape Welt likes to put into their puzzles. And I got to see like the inner workings, and what can slide, what shouldn't slide, what should be manipulated, and where they like to hide information. I worry that this puzzle would be an exercise in frustration for anyone who has never tried to solve one of these wooden puzzles before. That's actually an important note, because the wood has a certain level of flex to it. I expect that if this were a puzzle made out of a firmer, more rigid material, there would be differences in what could or could not be achieved in a puzzle. True. Now, bearing that fact that, that someone new would probably be lost here, I think if you're someone who loves 3D puzzles, or if you know someone who loves them, I think this is one of the finest out there. It is by far the best looking puzzle that Escape Boat's produced so far and makes an awesome display piece. And honestly, it looks cool whether you've gotten it open yet or not. Well, as we talked about in our other Escape Welt box reviews, where these boxes really shine is as gift boxes to give to others after you've mm -hmm. opened them up and put something cool inside. Now, in this case, it might even be worth picking it up just to do that, just to give it as a gift box. Well, it's not online yet. You can't get it. Escape Welt will be publishing a quick open guide that will get you to the inner chamber quickly. That way you can toss something in there and pass the entire thing along as a gift without having to actually solve the puzzle yourself. And one final incentive for any of you on the fence, another nice touch Escape Welt added to the Kickstarter is to be able to get their previous puzzles along with the Quest Tower at the same time for quite a reduced price. You can even get every single one of their existing puzzles along with this new one for 199 euros, I guess. Now, personally, I really enjoyed playing around with the Quest Tower and was very impressed when I managed to get it open. Um, there are some really clever bits here, clever ways to interact with it that I've, I've never seen before. Um, and it required some out-of-the-box thinking. And honestly, I, I was super impressed, and I can't wait till probably next year and see what Escape Well cooks up next. Now, one final bit of promotion before we go. As affiliates of Escape Well, they have provided us with a 10% off discount code that, while it won't work on the Kickstarter, can be used on any production uh, products in their web store. This discount stacks on any existing sales. Just enter bellhop, one word, B-E-L-L-H-O-P, when checking out. Now, as for the Kickstarter, we do have an affiliate link for that, too. And if you are considering backing, it would be awesome if you used our link to do so. That will be in the show notes. Now, I also invite you to check out my written preview of the Quest Tower over the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. I did get into a bit more detail there, and I share quite a few spoiler-free pictures of this great-looking puzzle. As this is our fifth podcast birthday, what better game to review next than the birthday burglary from Grand Gamers Guild, who we have to thank for handing over a review copy of this puzzle game. The Birthday Burglary is the fifth game in the Holiday Hijink series of Escape Room in a Box games by Jonathan Schaefer, who also did the card art here. Package design and package artwork is by Josh Capel, with all of these games being published by our friends at Grand Gamers Guild. As you may have noticed, we aren't playing this in order, having reviewed number two, the Independence Incident last week, and now moving on to number five. This isn't a problem, as each of these 18-card puzzle games are standalone experiences. Now, this one in particular was just published last year and features a one-hour timer, though it may take your group longer than that. While the packaging states this is a game for one or more players, Board Game Geek lists it as a max of four and best at three, and I can't argue with that. Where Board Game Geek seems a bit off is the recommended age of 13 plus. Yeah. We didn't see any reason this couldn't be a family game experience with even younger kids. One important thing to note is that you are going to need access to the web to play this game. The way it works as a full puzzle experience and only 18 cards is by being web driven. You'll be interacting with the page for the game to input your answers, read the ongoing story and evolving story, get hints if you need them, as well as doing research for any of the puzzles you don't recognize. We haven't bothered doing un unboxing videos for any of these holiday hijinks games, as they are a puzzle-based experience that can only be played once, and we don't want to spoil anything. Mm -hmm. Plus, there really isn't much to show off. You get a card holder with instructions on the back of it, and in that is an 18-card deck of cards. That's it. No other components. So each of the holiday hijinks games, or at least the two we've tried, play rather differently, but start the same. 
You read the instructions on the back of the card package. You scan the QR code and head to the game's webpage. Read the little introduction there. Start the timer. Flip over the first card and go. Compared to the Independence Incident, the Birthday Burglary seems to have been a very different type of puzzle. Yeah, where the last one was like a linear set of puzzles based on U.S. history that kind of told the story, this felt quite different. Most of the cards here show you scenes where you can choose to interact with the various objects you see. You quickly start accumulating a number of objects, some useful, some not, and then you can use those either with each other or with the objects on the cards. So more of a point and clicks adventure style experience? Yeah, exactly. And honestly, this one gave more of an escape room feel because of that. It also reminded me a bit of the Coded Chronicles games that we reviewed in the past that my family adored. Now, there are some traditional puzzles here as well. It's not all just figuring out what to use with what. And the games page on the web has an entire hint system to help you uh, if you get stuck, as well as a bunch of reference information for things you may need to solve the puzzles that the player players just may not know. In particular, the info section for this game contained a number of common ciphers like Pigpen, ASCII, and Number Substitution, as well as Morse code. Now, each holiday hijinks game is given a difficulty. This one is listed as the easiest, at one out of three. Now, you played this on Gwen's birthday. How did it go? It went pretty well. Having already done one holiday hijinks game before, we were able to dive right in. What we weren't expecting, though, was just how different it played, how the different styles of puzzles were between the birthday burglary and the one we reviewed last week. It just had a very different vibe and feel where the last one felt like an interactive story where we're trying to solve puzzles to progress the plot. This felt more like an exploration adventure. Now that could be a good thing though. If you're not expecting it, that could be a wrench in your plans as well. Now, as for it supposedly being easier than the last one, like the, the last one was a three out of three. This is a one out of three. Let's just say our all Canadian team did much better on a game about American history than we did on this. Now, there was one puzzle here that was based on a noisemaker that had us stumped for a long time. In the end, I think we were all overthinking it a bit too much and trying to do some arts and crafts to solve it that probably weren't necessary. Now, the one bonus this had is it did teach me something I didn't realize that was part of the game. If you take too long between entering answers, the game notices this, and on the web, the, the hint button starts to flash at you. Well, interesting to have the timer be proactive like that, but you point out a real problem with the sheer volume of puzzles and such that you play as a family. It's mm -hmm. hard to calibrate for the difficulty. It's far too easy to think outside the box when the solution might really be just right there in the box. Yeah, by the end, we still end up with 4.5 out of 5 stars. And would have been under an hour if it wasn't for that one puzzle, but we were just slightly over. Our overall, it actually took less time than the Independence Incident, and we got the same score. So I guess it was slightly easier uh, in the end, but it didn't really feel that way while playing. It felt more frustrating. Well, difficulty for this sort of thing can just be so subjective. Mm -hmm. I think of crosswords, where an easy puzzle for some people may be tough to a crossword regular if they aren't up on, for instance, current pop culture. Now, one thing that was better in the birthday burglary was the ability to play with more players. There were five of us, and due to the nature of the puzzles, there were things that different groups of us could work on in the same time. Which I think is good, as that means this game would be something that should work at a birthday party, albeit a small one, and keep more than just the birthday person involved. That's a big bonus, is you don't want to get this for a birthday party and then have everyone sitting around watching one person do the whole thing. Now, as um, an aspect I actually appreciate about this game is that it's a birthday game, actually. I, I can't think of any other hobby game that has a birthday theme. And this actually does a really good job of filling a niche I didn't realize I really wanted filled. But I would love to see more hobby birthday games. It's true. Well, there are many mass market birthday games out there. Most are the sort of frivolous games you'd at most play once a year on a child's birthday. Now, while we all enjoyed the birthday burglary, I can't help comparing it to the independence. In it. And for whatever reason, we had more fun with the first one. What impresses me the most, though, about both games is just how different they are. They're both by the same designer. They both use 18 cards, but each feels like a different game and a different experience actually impresses me a lot and makes me even more curious to check out more games in this series. 
While with more than half a dozen of these games so far, it will be interesting to see how varied they all are in style. In the end, I can't help but recommend The Birthday Burglary for anyone who enjoys puzzle stylus, style games and escape room in a box experiences. Especially the ones that enjoy the escape room feel, because this one did feel more like an escape room than the last one that just felt like a series of puzzles. The low price point, portability, and ability to jump right in is hard to pass up for fans of this type of game. Now, while that's true for all holiday hijinks games, I think where the birthday burglary adds to this is being a perfect birthday gift. Being a perfect gift, this game could also be a great way to see if a friend, family member, or fellow, fellow gamer would enjoy this style of game. It could be the birthday burglary is the perfect first step into the larger world of puzzle games and escape rooms in a box, plenty of which we've reviewed in the past if you're looking for a next step. If you aren't into puzzles and prefer pushing cubes, battling armies, and rolling dice, I can't see this game winning you over. But you can't beat the price if you just want to try this style of game out. There's even a print-and-play option available at Grand Gamers Guild at half the regular price, so perfect if you do want to give it a try. Well, that's it for our spoiler-free look at The Birthday Burglary. We can't help but be impressed by the amount of puzzle punch you get in such a small package with these holiday hijinks games. There are a lot of games out there that only use 18 cards. What's your favorite? Love Letter? Circle the Wagons? Let us know about it in the comments below. If you want more holiday hijinks, head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where you can find written reviews of all of the Escape Room in a Box games we played so far. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Now tonight we're deviating from our standard format just a bit as it's our fifth anniversary. We recorded the first ever episode of our podcast back on July 26th, 2018. That's exactly five years ago today, the day we are recording this. In celebration of that milestone, we're going to be doing a bit of a retrospective, as well as answering some anniversary-worthy questions that we got from some of our biggest fans on our Discord channel. Now, before that, though, I think we have to at least answer a few of the questions that most board game podcast listeners expect to hear during an anniversary episode, like what are some highlights from the last year as far as our content goes? Well, the big one that people uh, can see who are watching this live or here on our chat or watching on YouTube um, is the fact we have built a new studio in my basement. We uh, finally set up the new PC, which I've been talking about for way too long, and moved our recording space from our upstairs office slash used to be a bedroom into my actual game room. And you can now see the game shelves behind me, at least part of them. And you a can small, kind of see the window. <laughs> yes, it's a small, yes, I know, built a new studio, sounds so impressive. But it's a more permanent setup. Um, some of the things that's kind of nice is the fact that like this boom arm here for my mic, I can easily push out of the way and back in, and I just leave it set up. Um, what you can't really see is I actually have a, a green screen set up over here, which we'll get to in a bit there. Um, we have way more lighting. We have more cameras. We've done quite a bit to upgrade the space and broadcast. Most importantly, especially for unboxing videos, is actually broadcast at a higher resolution. And then I actually have a whole new location and office that I'm working out of. So that's been a pretty big change. Now, I did set it up pretty quickly, though, and there are still more optimizations coming out of this location as well. Um, I have new camera. So we now have th I now have three cameras. Um, I'm too zoomed in for you to be able to see it. But there is a camera that I'm looking at. There's actually a camera up here um, for doing a top down view, which will be great if uh, for unboxings or if I'm building anything. And we may also use for actual plays eventually. And I also have one over here to my right that just stays there with a TV tray set under it. Uh, that's where the green screen comes in. I've got a green and blue screen chroma keyed um, mouse pad is what it is, a large mouse pad, so that I can now do close up shots of our videos without just having to hold things up to the camera and hope they come into focus. And then uh, I've been working on my video editing skills, uh, learning how to do more with our content. Uh, now, some of it is not at all obvious to you viewers out there, and that's kind of the point. Uh, but the workflow on putting out the videos and the podcast itself after we record is 100% different than what I was doing a year ago. Uh, my entire workflow and how the show comes together, how we get it all put together, 
in order to distribute to you as a mm -hmm. on YouTube or on the audio stream are is in fact completely different now than what we did before. Uh, one of the big ones is we went to a con, like an actual game convention and a pretty big one at that. Um, our first, at least for Dan and our first con experience in four years. And it was awesome. Like, I, I, I felt like returning home. I loved being at the con. I'd, Columbus was awesome. Downtown Columbus, getting some of the food, uh, running into a few people, not as many as I'd hope, but people of con friends, as people like to call them. But uh, most importantly for our podcast is concerned is connecting with so many publishers, uh, both a mix of ones we've worked with in the past, some we are currently working with, like the op we kind of hung out with quite a bit, as well as reconnecting with people we worked with a long time ago that we hadn't seen since the previous con season. And even more so, possibly more importantly, is making new connections at the con. It was a fantastic thing for our podcast like for our brand um we, we're set for reviews for quite some time now and like stuff we're excited about it's not like we went in there and said we'll take anything like like actually genuinely excited to work with these publishers and share share their games with you uh, i think it was actually more than probably five years for me since i've attended a con so that was definitely a big one uh, i am not a big crowd people but you put a camera in my hand and i kind of ignore the people to some degree <laughs> so uh, that makes it a little easier for me. Uh, it was definitely different uh, than a lot of the cons we've gone to. You know, this this was more like a breakout con for uh, was for me where we actually, you know, were there as media and doing mm -hmm. things unlike going to uh, Border City Con and just hanging out and playing games. Uh, so the other thing is uh, we've updated our graphics uh, with great thanks to Gwen for the graphics on our podcast, on our YouTube, our, our waiting streams, all our fancy uh cartoonish i don't mean our cartoon but uh 2d graphics that uh we've got now mm -hmm. that have come up this year are all thanks to mo's daughter uh and the fantastic animations and images that she's used that are you'll see now on our thumbnails as well as throughout the show yeah and that's something i, I hope to integrate more in at some point i'll get rid of the close-up of my face on everything and switch over to the the graphic version it's just a bit of uh having to reset up well except um, that, yeah, some of the stuff unfortunately people on there is something to be said about people on uh, on your thumbnails and, and there's definitely a, a bump to that so it's hard to say yeah maybe it's better how it is yeah what i need to do this is in the i'm jumping ahead to some of our future plan i need just need more headshots yeah so it's not the same two pictures all the time where my beard's a little scraggly at that particular time too like i, I need to i should take one today you know i trimmed everything up <laughs> today um with the bellhop shirt on right which would definitely be better but yeah, that, that, some of those graphics were actually a gift for last year's birthday. Last year, our four-year, Gwen provided some of that and has done some additional work, like uh, adding Sean to things, which is pretty awesome. Uh, another really big one, potentially, for us as the Tabletop Bellhop for the podcast and all of our content is we decided to join Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association. Uh, no, we don't manufacture games. Gamma started that way. Uh, quickly expanded into the retail space as well as the manufacturer space, um, but now has added, um, as of last year, the year before, a new media and press element of uh, Gamma. So we are now official voting members of Gamma. And that's actually part of what got us to go to Origins, because this year, to go as media, um, they, they basically favored Gamma members, which I guess makes sense. It's a Gamma show. Um, not sure I, what we're like, um, one of the things we did sign up for, I haven't, it's, it's my own fault. I haven't pursued, um, they were looking for someone to write articles for them and I, I should be pushing that a little harder. I still get their newsletters and I see the things that's going, what's coming up. Um, I just not sure where this is going to go. Um, the plan right now is to definitely renew for another year and then attend the gamma trade show. Now, the Gamma Trade Show is one of the the first cons, so that's a big thing, being able to go to Gamma. It's something that, that used to be only publishers and retailers go, and it's a big con for publishers to promote their products to retailers. And I think being there as the fly-on-the-wall media would really cool, be really cool. Um, the other thing is there's a bonus that they're moving it to Louisville, and it happens that Deanna has family in Louisville, so it would be a cheaper trip for us being able to stay with family. 
So the plan right now is to stick with Gamma next year and go to the Gamma trade show, go to Origins, and then we'll take a look if the membership's been worth it. Yeah, I think this could be a great thing for us. Uh, I, I saw media at Gamma Expo this year, um, you know, finally getting getting their, their hands on on things, previews of stuff that uh, we weren't able to see at Origins because it wasn't at Origins mm -hmm. and it's not getting released until later this year. So, uh, you know, it, there's definitely a benefit to us if we can get there. Um, as for the Gamma membership itself, I think Gamma does unfortunately need to step up a little bit and find a little bit more direction. Uh, they yeah. did have spent so long as a retail and, and manufacturers association that the expansion has hit some road bumps. Uh, they're yep. still finding their legs and I think they've got time to do that, but they do need to step up and do that. Yeah, this is definitely, it, it fuels new still media and press arm of Gamma is definitely the the new mutation that they're not quite sure what to do with yet. Now, something we did um, somewhat behind the scenes, I'd say info's out there, people go looking for it, but we did update our about page on the blog. Um, we made a master list of every game we reviewed. Um, not sure if that's 100% up to date, but it's pretty close. Uh, we created and formalized an official review policy. Uh, we made a number of info sheets and PDFs we can send to publishers and potential advertisers. We set rates for things like advertising. Uh, again, stuff that I don't know if the average listener really cares, but that information is out there. And if you are a publisher who's interested in look at, working with us, now you that information is right there on the web. And just this last week, uh, one thing that is a little bit noticeable, it's not in your face, but it's there. Uh, is we're, we're trying not to make it in your face. <laughs> we've started updating our disclosures to fall in line with new regulations and guidance from the FTC. So you may notice us mention affiliate and uh, and publisher. You know this was provided by uh, publishers for free, etc. A little more often than we used to in the past, and it's going to pop up as a graphic on videos a little more often as well. Yeah, this is going to be definitely noticeable for anyone who uh, consumes our content through video. Uh, you're going to see pop-ups basically saying, hey, this is a review copy, which is something the FTC guidelines have been updated and the, and the rules have changed a bit. Um, they want more disclosure. We think we're, we're, we're all for disclosure. We want people to know we have existing relationships with publishers, uh, though some of the requirements seem a little ridiculous. Like in three years' time, when I say a picture of me playing a game that I got as a review copy three years ago, having to tag that seems like a bit much. But you will start to hear more of that. Um, that's not us trying to be used car salesmen or anything. We're just trying to follow the rules. Yeah, this is to protect everyone because there are a number of bad actors out there, not necessarily in the board game space, but in the influencer space in general, who are being deceptive in their practices. And we yeah. are trying to follow the rules as closely as we can to help the FTC and other organizations fight back against deceptive advertising and review practices. Uh, speaking of affiliates, we've added a bunch of new ones. Um, one of the best places to find a list of these, if you go to our Discord, there is a pinned post in, I think it's in the board game deals section. I should have figured that out before saying this. Okay. Um, there, there is a section where we list as many of the affiliates we have as possible. Now, I did run out of characters, so I probably have to update that. Um, we got Mysterious Package Company, which has been fantastic for us so far. Uh, plus, we have an actual discount code for them, which is bellhop, all one word. Escape Well, same deal. New affiliate, loving their puzzles, discount code, bellhop, save 10%. Geekify, which we got to see their stuff in person at Origins. Oh my God, is it amazing? This is a company that, that geekifies stuff. It upgrades stuff. They they produce like deluxe covers for D&D hardbacks and stuff like that. Really neat stuff. Um, they have maps and like you can get pages from the Necronomicon. Uh, Evil Genius Games, who seems to have gotten the license for every action movie ever made. Uh, this is an RPG company that is doing the latest edition of D20 Modern and release, releasing a bunch of games based on that, like Escape from L.A. and Terminator and Predator. Um, Outsmarted, the, the trivia game we reviewed a couple weeks back, gave us an affiliate as well as a discount code, which if I remember is also Bellhop. We're trying to make it so they're all the same. And if they give us something else, we're like, please change it to Bellhop. Um, Puzzling Pursuits, La Famiglia, and um, what was the other one? Black Brim uh, were the two puzzles we tried out with them. They also became affiliates, which is, is pretty cool. And again, using these doesn't cost you anything. 
Um, I don't understand the hate against affiliate links because it's just it's a mutual beneficial relationship between us and a publisher. The publisher sells more games and we get a cut for helping them sell more games. That's all there is to it. It doesn't cost you anything. We get a small kickback on every purchase. Now, huge thanks to everyone that does use our links when shopping for games. That is what lets us keep doing this show. Well, that's all stuff about the show and our other content. But let's talk a bit about games. What is the best new to us game that we played this past year? Well, we're all about board games, not just not just selling them and affiliates. Yes. Um, so many good choices. Especially when you realize, like, uh, like our year isn't starting January, right? I got to go back to July last year, and there was some awesome stuff we discovered in like August. Um, so, so one of the big ones has got to be Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Uh, that was was a, our most played game. I played a ton of that, and mainly trying to review all the expansions. Uh, Thrones of Valeria, which a, a great trick taking game. Point Salad, simple to learn, very accessible. Throw it in Deanna's purse. Uh, Chisel, the deck deconstruction game. Shobu, which I am absolutely adoring. I'm sorry, Boop, but Shobu I like better. A pocketbook adventures. Do you, everyone remember the one month where I was going on about that thing? I loved that game. I, I really am tempted to go with Thrones of Valeria. I want to. I love Thrones of Valeria. We taught it just Saturday at the barbershop bar, but there's those clarity issues. And those clarity issues came up again this past weekend. We had people calling me over to the table and say, what's this mean? Is this, what is this number? And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's a gray eight. And we're in a, it's not that dark in that bar, but it's not perfectly well lit. So because of that, I can't give it to the top spot. So what I think I'm going to go with is point salad, which ironically, I think is funny because it's, we didn't get a review copy. We, we, we were not working with AEG. Uh, this is one we bought for ourselves while on vacation because we found a good price out in the middle of nowhere in northern Ontario. I just so small and portable, simple to teach, but featuring really engaging gameplay. And I haven't gotten sick of it yet. Uh, for me, I'm going with one again. This this isn't a review copy. This is this is something I I paid for uh myself and backed, and that is the DC deck builder injustice. Uh, because what I really love about the injustice is how well they nailed the pvp version of the game uh it's not the first pvp but it just it really encapsulates that whole um you know player versus player section so well uh both at two i've played it both at two and three and i think it's a little stronger at two but it was still a solid three-player game uh and it really brought a lot of new and interesting dynamics to the dc deck building uh, game that really shocked me. No, oh, totally fair. Now I'm going to call it something from the chat here for those who can't read what Ryan Stephen. So Ryan was just mentioning about affiliates. The, the affiliate suggests that someone's shilling for the products. I I can see that if we were only affiliates with one company. The fact we have so many different affiliates for different publishers and different things. Uh, to me, like I'm I'm shilling for everyone. <laughs> Plus, like we just talked about two games for companies we don't have relationships with. So I don't think it's a problem for us. Um, uh, so so I, I think that's it. Um, but I, I guess that could be at least one reason. And, and, and again, as the Inch Games points out in the chat, we are picky. Uh, we don't yep. take every affiliate link that gets offered to us no. or every product <laughs> code. Uh, if you don't fit in with the Bellhop brand, you're not going to get linked or mentioned. Nope. Totally true. All right, so what? Uh, what do you? What's your biggest surprise of last year? All right, I had to think about this one because there were a lot. Like, like there were quite a few um, pocketbook adventures. I just mentioned. I, I kind of want to call out, but I think we actually called that one out on the two hundredth episode, just because I'm like, I totally wasn't expecting as much fun as I had with that. Uh, the next one I was considering was uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Because I expected big, overproduced, shiny miniatures. Look how pretty it is. Oh, it's a licensed game where you chuck a bunch of dice. And that's not at all what it is. Well, okay, that's part of what it is. But it's actually really fun and a well did game. And what really won me over on that one is that Deanna was sold on it by the end. And Deanna is not a cooperative game player. And yes, this is competitive. You, there, you are trying to be first among equals, but there are a lot of cooperative aspects. 
and Deanna enjoying it was a big thing. But you know what? I, I need to push that one aside, though, because I am still in shock. And another licensed game, so this this fits well with uh, with the theme here, is Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. I, I, I'm shocked by how good that game is and the fact no one else is talking about it. Like, like it is such it is one of the best deck builders I played. It's one of the better competitive games I played. Like the way you can and interfere with each other and move each other around and the way it matters that all the, where the miniatures are and the way they tied in the theme of these bounty hunters kind of working together to take people down. But you want to be the person that finally catches the criminal. Like, I just love that game. For me, and again, we are I didn't even realize that we were sticking with a theme here, but yes. <laughs> mine is also a licensed product, and that's the My Little Pony deck builder. Um, I had been laughing about this. I had been making jokes and puns in the background and and like, oh great, you know, this is this is fun. And and I knew it wasn't aimed at kids. But what I didn't realize was not only is it not aimed at kids, it's actually a solid deck builder that's bringing new things to the mm -hmm. deck building genre that is introducing some complex mechanics that you don't always see in a deck builder. Yeah. And, and so as a result, I really kind of had to eat crow and, and instead of laughing about my little pony, admit that darn, if it wasn't for the graphical problems in this game, uh, this would be a fantastic deck builder game for mm -hmm. anyone, regardless of your love or dislike for my little pony. Yeah, totally agree. And maybe it's just because we're old and jaded, but I guess we have a thing against licensed games because we're, we're still traumatized by our childhood and where we obviously expect, <laughs> I know, but we, we obviously expect them to be garbage. I know it's not true nowadays. There are tons of awesome licensed games out there. Uh, we, uh, Star Wars Imperial Assault is still one of my favorite games and it's Star Wars. But it's just like the fact that our three, like the games we're mentioning as our biggest surprises are yet again, good licensed games, I think says something. We we need to move on, I think, from thinking, getting that stuck in our head. Fair enough. Uh, next, I want to do most unique game. What what stuck out as completely, really different? Um, For me, that's Once Upon a Line. Because someone took lottery scratch cards using a tool to scratch off silver crap to reveal something underneath and made that into a story driven board game with fantastic art and what seemed to be an engaging story. Now we only got to try a prototype of this and uh, we only got to play like the intro. So we didn't get a real deep dive in this, but the fact someone gamified scratch tickets, it just blows me away. Like, like I'm always looking for something new and I, usually it's a new theme that comes out or maybe a slight twist on a mechanic. This was something I've never seen before. Like this just blew me away in the, wow, there is thinking outside of the box. And for me, we haven't actually reviewed this yet, but we have talked about it. And that is reality shift deluxe. This has game has done so much with geometry and reimagining mm -hmm. of the board game into three dimensions. Um, the, the way this game makes you think about the space of, of game uh is is to me at least as uh inventive and interesting as you know turning something like a scratch ticket into a board game mm -hmm. it really kind of thought uh outside the box despite the fact that they are in fact using boxes all right next i want to highlight my favorite review favorite review we did um there's two though i i i have to cheat a bit here um number one this is where i put horizon zero dawn because like I, I had fun the first time we played it with Kat and Tori, and I was shocked by how they managed to get the feel of Horizon Zero Dawn without making it the video game. You're not Aloy. You're not exploring cauldrons. You're not uniting tribes. It focuses on one small part of the game world and does it well so you get that feel of that one part of the game. And that blew me away. That part was awesome. The other thing, though, was in particular a Sean Con, a, a, a three day gaming weekend where Sean was over and Deanna, Sean and I played through an entire hunt in one weekend. Now, a hunt in that game is five encounters, each of which can take two hours. So you're looking at like a 12 hour game experience or, or, or 16. I don't even know how many hours we spent. And the way the enjoyment of that game evolved 
from that first hunt and looking for stuff in the rule book and trying to figure out some of the weird idiosyncrasies of the game and completely forgetting that every time you dodge, you have to move your figure to the last couple of battles where we were actually like in character. We each had our own playing styles. Our characters had evolved to be completely different. Sean and Deanna hated me because I kept stealing their kills. And we had a ton of fun in a game with a lot of issues. And I think that all came out really well in that particular final review. But just the format of the review, what, what the words we chose to use, how we talked about it. Now, part two, the second game that, that, that I have to give like an honorable mention to, I guess, would be Scythe. The game I hated that I grew to love. And the shifting, my shifting opinion on the game as I played it with more people and gained system mastery over it. Scythe also is our most popular review on the blog. It gets more hits than anything else. And I don't know if that's because people are curious about Scythe or that people are enjoying my journey with that particular game. And I think that one shows more of my changing experience with the game than any of the other reviews we've done. So for me, uh, it's going to be Cowboy Bebop. Uh, again, it's a game that hardly anyone knows about, but is such a solid deck builder with unique aspects with the player control and the, the mm -hmm. location movement. It was just a delight to play and to experience as a game, as well as, you know, through the review, sharing it with others who probably haven't heard of it because for some reason, nobody's heard of it. Uh, and yep. so for favorite review, I think I have to pick Bebop again because I want to share this game to other people. Other people need to know about this game. All right. I know in general, we try to keep things positive. Now, we don't edit our reviews. We don't choose what to review based on. We don't only do positive reviews. We're not the kind of people who won't say anything negative about a game. But we do vet the games before we even agree to review them. And that is a change since year one, um, or even more so when I used to do the Windsor gaming resource and posted reviews on my own before we had a podcast, I basically was like, Hey, I got free games. This is cool. I'll review anything. Um, that has shifted. I, we get offers to review games probably daily anymore. And I turn down way more than I accept. So I do research before actually getting a game to review. So in general, we're talking about games we're excited about that we wanted to play and that we thought we'd enjoy. But sometimes that doesn't quite work out. And sometimes the games aren't quite what we expect. I'm going to pass this one to Sean first. We switch things up a bit. But what would you say was your biggest disappointment this year, game-wise? You know what? I have to say, and this is interesting because you actually, you actually already mentioned this, but I'm going to say once upon a line. So while I will give them props for trying something new and interesting, um, and congratulations to them. They funded on Kickstarter, more power to them. Uh, this game just did not do it for me. Um, I think it probably would have made a fun mobile app, uh, but yeah. between the effort and the mess and the, the way the, you know, yes, it's a multiplayer game, but you still have to have one person sitting there scraping things off and everyone else looking over their shoulders. It just didn't do it for me. And, uh, I, I just didn't feel like it cut it as a physical uh game and uh i think you know some of the some of the problems that their kickstarter is having with shipping may be indica in indicative of that same sort of problem i'll admit i have not looked back at this one since we did the review uh preview i should say um i i have no idea how the kickstarter is doing i did watch it enough to find out it funded i did consider backing it because i did enjoy the the experience of this game i, I was impressed by a couple aspects of it like the, the way they tied in hints in the story to what you were looking for. Um, I really want to see the final reviews. I, I want to see what other people have to say about this game. I, 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 it may have just been a gimmick. And I totally get Sean. The reason Sean didn't enjoy it, I fully understand. And I don't necessarily disagree with. Now, for me, it's Hunt a Killer Mystery at the Hunter's Lodge. It's a, based on an Agatha Christie book. Um, you're probably going, what? I don't remember, like, unless you happen to catch the right episode where we talked about this in the Ask the Bellhops, or sorry, the Bellhops tabletop segment, you're probably like, whoa, I don't remember a review on that. Well, that's because we haven't. And there's a reason for that. So this is 
probably the most, I think it's definitely the most expensive game in my collection as a single purchase. Like uh, we have probably spent more money on Imperial Assault if I had in all the expansions. And if I take Gloomhaven plus the box insert plus, you know, uh, Jaws of the Lion, we might be getting up the same price. But this is a very expensive, very high end board gaming product that is an actual wooden chest that you open up that has physical artifacts in it that include things like a drinking flask, uh, a working watch, a banner, a house banner and everything. And it's a murder mystery. You are trying to find out what happened at the Hunter's Lodge. And it looked amazing. And we got this mainly from my mother-in-law, who is a big Agatha Christie fan, and Deanna, who loves this style of game. I like puzzle escape room in a boxes. I like the 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 solve the puzzle, I, whatever. Here, use this cipher, get these clues, fold the paper the right way, assemble the thing and look up to the light, that kind of thing, right? The escape room boxes, the, the 3D puzzle boxes. Deanna likes the murder mysteries. Here's a bunch of facts. Here's a bunch of clues. You're going to use the itinerary to figure out what time the person was at the place. And like, that's what she likes. We were so hyped for this game. Plus, Hunter Killer hooked us up with an affiliate program. So we're like, hey, this is great. We have this rather expensive high-end game that looks fantastic that we'll get to talk about that'll probably work out well for us. Then we sat down to play, and we were having a great time for, it might have been two, three hours. And then we got so completely and utterly stuck. We're like, what is wrong? Like, like there is no way for us to progress from here. So we then started digging into it, and one of the things that comes in the box, and this is a recommendation for anyone doing these kinds of games, if the game gives you an inventory and checklist, check it. An entire book was missing from our copy of the game. Fine, mistakes happen. I contacted them, and I asked for a replacement book. When I get that replacement book, we'll finally publish our review, because it still hasn't shown up. They still have done nothing to help us out, other than to send me a PDF. And I'm sorry, I am not going to print off a PDF for a very expensive wooden game box that part of the whole thing is the physical artifacts. S give me the actual manual that's missing that I can hold in my hands and touch, not a couple sheets of paper I print off my printer. So, uh, sorry, hunt a killer. Um, to make it even worse, they canceled their affiliate program. So even if we were talking about it, we don't even get like that small part of it. Out of that so yeah biggest disappointment deanna's biggest disappointment as well she's agreeing in the chat room is uh hunter killers mystery at hunter's lodge and uh their lack of support customer support yeah like absolutely I all right well another part of birthdays besides looking back is looking ahead so we look towards the future so one of the ones that I thought was interesting when I was going through our reviews and, and things that we published this year is that we did way more previews and prototypes and reviewer copies and early releases than any previous year. And this is even after saying we're no longer doing Kickstarters from independent companies that keep shipping us in, in, <laughs> incomplete games that we end up having to play test instead of review. No, these are like near finished products. And I'm wondering, again, I'm going to let Sean go first on this one, is um, if there's one in particular, now that we've done the preview, we've done we, the, the Kickstarter is live, we, we've showed off the, the prototype, is there something you are waiting for the final version? What are you most excited to see come to fruition? I'm actually really interested in seeing uh, for or, and, and rooting for Maxime to get Hellbringer out to their backers. Uh, you know, that finally funded, they had a rough, rough period the first time they attempted it. Yeah. They stepped back, made some readjustments, you know, made some new decisions and came out strong again this year in March and had a successful Kickstarter for a game that I think really did some fun and interesting things and, uh, more power to Maxime and, the, and his company for, uh, what's coming with Hellbringer. Now for me, it's going to be Castellans of Valeria. That game was really solid uh and, and it, uh, folk on a map area majority game but instead of units you're building buildings with some neat die mechanics fantastic components which look even better based on the kickstarter i am really looking forward to castle of valerian seeing the final project pro product 
I think it's going to be very similar to when we did the preview of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria and the final product came and it was very similar to what we got to try out. But I do know there are going to be some some uh, improvements. So I'm looking forward to that. And I am still really curious what's going to happen with Martin Wallace's fighting fantasy adventures. Like I said, I'm, I'm sold on this one. The, the old school RPG fighting fantasy novel board game. I, I want to see how this will do. The Castles of Valeria is number one. Or I, I'm, I'm cheating every time here, thrown in two, I guess. <laughs> um, but I want to know how Fighting Fantasy Adventures will do. Like, I have no idea. It, it was not doing well on Kickstarter. They made so we'll see change. how it does. Yeah, they, they, they made some big changes on, uh, when they went to GameFound, though. So as long as they get their marketing uh, ducks in a row, I think they could really hit it out of the park at GameFound. Yeah, we'll see if that takes off. Now, similar uh, question. We brought home a ton of stuff from Origins. We did still have some stuff on the pile of obligation before that and new stuff still showing up. So of everything we've yet to review, I, I want to hear the chat room answer this one as well. Actually, I want to know what the chat wants us to review next. Maybe, maybe we can rearrange the schedule a bit, but first off, I want Sean's opinion on what are you most excited to get to the table and get a review out there on? Yeah. So this is a tough one because we brought back so much. Uh, it's hard to keep it all straight in my head. I wasn't even there for some of the review copies yeah. we got. I was out, out wandering, so I didn't even necessarily get the preview before the box got into uh, into our hands. Um, you have the spreadsheet. I have to remember. Uh, <laughs> but I think the big no, the, no real surprise that the two that I am most looking forward to are Kapow or the Sentinels of Earth Prime. Uh, you know, stick with the supers. Yeah, one you're probably forgetting is Marvel Dice Throne. You probably want that oh, wow. one there yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that. I, 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 what I want to out of those three, if if we were going to play one this weekend, what would you most like to play? I'm interested in Kapow the most because I think Dice Throne and Sentinels. I've got some idea of what they are and what they'll do. Right. Kapow, I don't. Uh, and Kapow, okay. I'm really interested in seeing what it brings to the genre. Sounds good. Uh, this one's hard for me too. Um. Uh, to be fair, I'm still like Origins. I'm still hyped. I'm hyped about all those games, which is awesome. And I hope that doesn't fade. Uh, there are so many I want to try. Now, at this point, though, because of the hype, I've already played a bunch of them. Um, like we, we I played multiple games, the show boop, boop, uh, Star Frontiers. I am adoring Star Frontiers. Um, uh, oh, what is it called? Star, not Star Frontiers. That's the wrong name. Star Realms. Star Realms Frontiers. There, that's, I'm, I'm like, it's Star Frontier something. No, Star Realms Frontiers. Um, that is a great version of Star Realms. Uh, Elector Counts we played. Reality Shift we played. Birds of a Feather. Um, probably a few more I'm forgetting. Um, as far as reviews, I am ready on a bunch of them. Uh, ready to review. Uh, I could review Shobu right now on the show. I could review Boop. Um, Reality Shift I could probably cover, but not the deluxe stuff. Birds of a Feather. Um, so in a way in my head, those are done. What I most want to play though is distilled out of all the games we brought home. That seemed like the game that Deanna and I would enjoy the most, um, second possibly being Marrakesh from queen, but Marrakesh scares me. Whereas distilled, I feel ready to play. Um, Kapow is up there. I, I, that just looked quick and fun and light and I, and supers, and using dice, it's 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 super powered Yahtzee, and that seems really cool. And I think that one I, I is going to be great and a big hit at our local events. And then Starship Captains, I, I it's CGE. I love CGs. I don't think they publish a bad game. I honestly, I love CGE. And though we're not affiliates, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, I just love CGE stuff. Um, I I really want to try that one. I as I think part of it is we're watching a lot of Star Trek right now. So Starship Captains is up there. Uh, but but most of all, Distilled and Seas of Havoc. We actually got it out on the table <laughs> the other day and started going through it. And, and um, a naval war battle with deck building. Just it, it's I used to love the old Warhammer game, um, Man of War. But I never got into like most of the naval games were too complex. Like the ones my dad enjoyed was just too much for me. And And this looks like a nice balance between you know, silly dice chucker to complex strategy game. And I'm really looking forward to that. one. So yes, that's like every game we wrap back to origins is what I want to do next. <laughs> um, moving on. 
what about the show? We talked about games we want to play. What are we going to do to make the show better? Because constant improvement is uh, something that I want. Um, I We want to keep making things slowly better. So one of the things, hopefully no one in the chat noticed, uh, unless we somehow look better, um, is we are no longer using Zoom. I'm sorry, Zoom, you are way too expensive. This cuts a big uh, expense out of our, 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 our podcasting. We are now using Microsoft Teams, uh, which we expect to be a permanent change. Now, we have noticed one problem. For anyone who's been watching our shows, especially since I moved down to the new studio, I've been able to do it without headphones while the headphones are back. So if anyone knows a way to do noise canceling or whatever um, in Teams, we would love to hear it, but we haven't figured that out yet. And I would prefer not to be wearing these again. That's the only, so far, the only problem I've seen with Teams. Uh, so for me, um, I'm looking at a few, a number of technical shifts around on my end. Um, every time we make a change elsewhere, I things need to be updated on OBS. And because most of the, uh, one of them happened today, I didn't get all the, the changes in. So there's a couple little tweaks I do, but I'm actually looking at uh, almost redesigning the, the look of our uh, show. The show, all the pieces will stay the same, but the technical layers that we go through to uh, to do it um, makes things a little more difficult uh, than they need right. to be. Uh, like we actually have a, a, a the, the line down the middle of our screen here, there's actually a black line in graphics it's there. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go full screen right now, we have a black line there. Uh, and I'm looking at ways of trying to get rid of, of stuff like that so that we have more flexibility. Um, and then we're going to sort of experiment with some new, new styles um, that may, you know, maybe we'll go go live randomly some night or uh, <laughs> try some brunch yes. shows to, to test things out so that we aren't just experimenting live for our podcast, which kind of matters to us. You know, this is the, the bread yeah. and butter. Um, so we may experiment other ways, um, but you'll see some changes coming uh, into, and hopefully some of them you won't see, but some of them yeah. you will as well. Now, one of the big things I want to change is a new setup for anything I record here. Now, again, this is um, software based. Uh, the hardware, like I said, we now have three cameras, right? Um, so we want to try to change things up so that we can use the three camera setup feeding three different feeds as it is now, specifically for the podcast, I am sending Sean one image off the one, one, uh, camera. Well, it'd be nice if I could, you know, show a close up of something now and then, or whatever, in the middle of our review, I can hold up a card or something like that. So that's one thing. The other thing is for our the stuff I record here, just myself, the, the stuff that's not done over Teams or Zoom, uh, like our unboxings and uh, hopefully getting back into actual plays, is that being able to send Sean all three cameras as three different feeds or save them as three different video files so that we can do some actual post work on it, some post-production work on them. Now, what this will probably mean, though, is less live streams. It'll probably mean we need to start recording stuff, just recording stuff, and then putting out a video eventually. Which, to be fair, uh, we don't get a lot of views on things like our unboxing videos. Um, the, the the podcast probably will always stay this way because we love interacting with the chat. I don't want to lose that. But like when we only get two people joining in for an unboxing and one of them, Sean, I don't think we're losing anything by just doing those not live. Right. And now there may actually be options that we can keep it live, but we aren't ruling out the option of stepping back because really right. what we're gaining here is the freedom for me to re remix essentially the content that Mo records, which can lead to tighter, more punchy content, which is better content for us to be discovered by to share out there in the world. Uh, you know, it's fantastic uh, to have people popping in and, and, and catching us on Twitch but if we can get a video that, you know, triggers something in the algorithm or gets shared or is just mm -hmm. more enjoyed by people on YouTube, that growth potential is really something we haven't managed to hook yet with anything other mm -hmm. than the, you know, one uh, <laughs> FAQ re read for uh, for Gloomhaven, uh, which isn't going to get any much isn't going to be doing anything anymore because yeah. now we're coming out with two with the second end. So really, we want to we want to come up with tighter uh, you know, YouTube content 
uh, yeah. for for that better, higher production value. Uh, next one, Gamma. I mentioned this earlier, but I, I was kind of jumping ahead. We have full plans to attend the Gamma trade show for the first time. Um, this is going to be only the second year that media and events arm of Gamma exists and is invited to the show. And and Gamma is kind of the unofficial start to con season, um, especially for new release part of con season. This will be one of the few times we really should be all about the new hotness. Plus, this will be a great way to make connections before Origins, something that we learned quickly on um at, at origins was people saying you know if we agree to it and we're good i can bring a copy to gen con well i want to be able to do that at gamma for origins so we can go try the game and say hey this looks great we want to check this out we want to we we would love to review this can you can we pick up a copy at origins is is what i would like to be able to do plus get that first look and then Speaking of Gen Con, I sure seems like we should go. Um, I, I swear every publisher we talked to was like, you're going to be at Gen Con, right? We can get you a copy of Gen Con. We could do this at Gen Con. Hey, at Gen Con, why don't we do an interview? Like like everyone was like, you should be at Gen Con. And we're shocked that we weren't going. So we might head to Gen Con. Might, very much might. This is, This is... Of all the, the the potentials, this is probably the 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 one that's biggest in the air. Um, that takes more time off. Uh, it's expensive. You need to find hotel space. It's also totally new to us. So Gen Con is a a small possibility. Yeah, and I definitely need to evaluate uh the variety of con options, um as well as you know the expenses and and time. I'm actually fully employed. The rest right. of the time, so I need to think about vacation time as well. Um, so yes, it. I mean, it, not to say that Mo and D don't aren't essentially taking vacation because they are no longer working when they're at a con. Oh, we're uh, definitely working well, when we're at the you're, con. You're not working on your on the affiliates and the the Amazon yes. and all the the things that you do in your home office. Uh, yes. Neither am I, and I have an employer who who may not like that as much as as you two, who being your own employers. Yes. So uh, we'll, we're going to I have to I have to see what's going on with that before I, I I decide where I'm going. Yeah, and we're also looking at some other Canadian cons like day trip style cons or maybe overnight cons instead of bigger ones. That's something I'd like to do more of. But we'll see that 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 is so up in the air. I don't even want to announce ones we're considering going to at this point. All right. I I could already use more coffee. Um. And we need to get to some questions from the fans. We've been talking a lot already. Um, but before we do, I think it is finally time to announce our latest giveaway. So as this is our fifth birthday, we wanted this giveaway to be both about us and our fans. So we decided to do top games and merch giveaway. So let's start with the top games part of things. Since it's our fifth birthday, we figured we would pick five of our top games from the past year. Games we just talked about earlier. One winner will get a chance to pick one of these five games. Your options are our best new to me games of the year, Point Salad, or DC Comics deck building game Injustice. Our biggest surprises of the year, My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, or Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Or the game we played the most together in the past year, which is Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Now that's the big prize based on us and the games we played. We're also going to have two consolation prizes, 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 consolation prizes based on something the fans have been asking for for years now. Pretty much as soon as we started, we've actually got some bellhop merch. That's right. Here's your chance to win an exclusive, probably never to be produced again, Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast coffee mug. The nice big ones you see us drinking from on the show. And no, we're not sending you our mugs. That would be gross. We've ordered two new mugs that we will be shipping out to two winners. So top prize choice of five games. Pick one. The games we played this year and two consolation prizes of Bellhop mugs. 
and her through the pinned post over at tabletopbellhop.com, which will go live at the end of the show. Now, this time around, sticking where we, with the usual um, follow us on social media, visit our Instagram page, visit the web page kind of thing, uh, we're also going to be asking for some feedback, which can we can hopefully use to make the show even better in the coming year. So not only is this a way to win a game or some merch, it's a way to have your voice heard and impact the future of the show. Now, we will, of course, have bonus entries for our hotel guest Patreon patrons. Watch your inbox in the next couple days. And so we got a question here from Jeff. You don't even need your notes up for a little while, actually. So uh, right. we, we got a question from Jeff in the Discord. Jeff Seuss asks, I would love to hear stuff about how the podcast, YouTube, blog, and such have grown over five okay. years. And any behind-the-scenes stories that haven't really been told yet. Uh, you know, maybe even things you wish you would have done differently when you first started Oof, that's a big one that, that that's like an all night we're done let's, <laughs> let's just talk about jeff's question all night uh note i have not prepared at all for these questions um i haven't even read them all in the show notes deanna kept that he's like what did you put in from the discord and i'm like i'm busy doing other stuff <laughs> um fair warning uh there is a chance i won't be live any second the storm is back and okay. and very loud outside so just just a a fair warning if power goes out I do not yet have a UPS downstairs here. So if, if power goes out, we're out. Yeah, my, so, my computers warning. will stay up. Unfortunately, the internet connection probably won't. So yeah, yeah. So so we'll see. I, I, I was sitting here and I'm like, what is that sound? And I'm like, oh, I know what that sound is. All right. Um, I, There's so many parts of that question. All right, so I'm going to have to bring grown? it up. What, uh, you know, how, how have we uh, grown? I, well, uh, as of today, and I think this is pretty cool. Happy birthday to us. We hit 500 followers here on Twitch, which I know compared to big time streamers is nothing. <laughs> but for us, 500 people follow this show. I think that's pretty cool. 500 people in five years. If we can get if we can get to 600 by next year. I'll be happy. Absolutely. Uh, YouTube. Uh, the, I, I don't know. YouTube was weird. I, I, YouTube I, makes me wonder if they play with things. So YouTube, the first hundred was really hard. Then like the next 500 were so, so. And when we hit about, what was it? Like 300? I'm, I'm trying to think of what it was. There was like a specific number. All of a sudden we were getting 10, 20 subs a day and it got us to a thousand. Now a thousand subs on YouTube is when you can start to monetize. It's also when you can get your, um, your own name like I, whatever you call that, a vanity URL, and you can set up your channel. And well, YouTube, of course, wants you to monetize. And it sure seemed like it was a 600, but like it it literally, like we hit this benchmark. I don't, I, I'm going to say 600. And then it just like flew. Like in, in two days, we got more subscribers than we had in two years. And suddenly we were partners. And I'm like, I swear YouTube does some fun, funky stuff there. Like I that they, they, they did some wonkiness to get us up to that level. And then once we hit 1050 dead, like, like stopped. Um, and very, very steadily have grown since then. Yeah. We, can, which, we do keep going up every once in a while. There's some people drop off. Some people get added on, but we have kept growing. We're 1500 ish or so now. I don't know the exact number, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we've never seen the kind of growth we had during that one specific, period of time um there are only a thousand tabletop gamers in the entire world uh, yeah uh so yeah that's great and then our we've had so many ups and downs with the audio podcast side uh unfortunately mm -hmm. audio podcasts have been in a decline universally of late yeah um with advertisers dropping out and you know everyone and their brother deciding to make a podcast and glutting the market and you know any number of things and we've had some some huge hits and we've had some huge misses we've had some bizarre things like pandora randomly featuring one of our episodes yeah. that blew the numbers uh just completely off the doors um and so that's that's been interesting um but really most more mostly the uh the audio podcast has basically just been slow and steady fans and we appreciate yep. every one of you 
who listens to the show wherever you listen to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, like there hasn't been, except for that weird YouTube blip. And then we did, we did suddenly, the, the podcast suddenly started getting more downloads, but I don't think that's a true stat in the fact I think we were already getting that, but it's just that what we were used to track it suddenly was tracking more places and, and getting more information. It was like, oh, OK, our numbers are 10 times better than we thought. That's kind of cool. Um, another thing, too, is the work from home movement, right? There's there's a lot of people um, who work from home and commutes have changed. And yeah. that's where a lot of people listen to podcasts. And I'll fully admit it. Uh, I don't listen to podcasts the way I used to. Cause I don't drive anywhere. Like it just doesn't happen anymore. Like I, if I'm driving across town, it's a 15 minute drive and I don't, I, I'm not commuting to work. I'm not taking easy row every day. So I've kind of stopped listening to podcasts. So I can't blame other people for stopping if even I don't do it. Yeah, no fair. Definitely fair. Uh, if I wasn't driving uh, to Hamilton regularly, I would, my list would be shorter. Although I have started lately when I'm preparing dinner, um there you go i've been doing doing some podcast listening even if i only get you know 20 minutes or half an hour in as i'm preparing and eating dinner uh, i've been trying to get a little bit more regular in that sort mm -hmm. of podcast listening because at one point my backup because of the pandemic and the lack of traveling my backup of podcast lists had gotten ridiculous well yeah mine <laughs> used to be the, the, the big thing that happened to me is my ipod touch finally died that is where i listened to podcasts was on my ipod touch and it finally died the one i I don't even know if it was a year ago. I showed off on the screen with how broken the thing was, but it was still working. Uh, it died and I have to find it. I still haven't found a pod catcher I enjoy. So that should be, I should just do it on Spotify because I mostly work on my PC where I could have Spotify open pretty much all the time, but I need to do it and I don't do it right now. Um, blog, blog, steady, steady increase. Um, we get spikes mainly from deals, right? Prime day was a big spike for us. Because uh, the Tabletop LHOP isn't just this podcast. It's not just our YouTube channel. It's also part of uh, part of our concierge, being your cardboard concierge, is carrying board game deals through um, Tabletop Gaming deals. And that tends to get us a big spike. The thing is, people stick around. We get a big spike. People go there to look for the deals. And they're like, oh, this guy reviews stuff. Oh, they've got a podcast. Oh, look, they do unboxings. Oh, look, here's an article on RPG map making software. And we get new fans that way. And the blog has increased every year at, at a pretty steady curve. Like a, a, there's no real, oh, we've made it moment. But I, it has been pretty awesome to, to slowly see it increase and slowly increase every year. So um, what about uh, things you wish you would have done differently when you first started? Anything you can think of? I don't know. I I'm I don't know. I, I kinda wish our video quality was better the whole time. Like like I feel like the big thing we missed out on was the well produced video when YouTube was still talking heads. We started as talking heads, we stayed talking heads, whereas everyone else started becoming commercials almost, like 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 production quality. Now I never expected to get there. But I kind of feel like we we missed the boat on being that type of content creator that now there's so many of them that I don't know if it would make a difference if we suddenly started doing it now because there are already so many established, super well produced um, and teaching like game teaching is something I feel I'm pretty good at. But we never did video of it because at the time there were already some people that were great at it. Now there are so many people doing teaching videos and it just, I guess it's a bit of jealousy or whatever, but I look at their numbers and I look at our numbers. And I'm like, man, maybe instead of reviewing games, we should be teaching games. Uh, for me, it's mostly uh, just sort of some technical stuff. There's, there's things I wish, uh, you, you know, could have, I could have set up differently. I would have understood and known differently uh, ways to set up the, the, the transitions and things on the, yeah. on, on the stream things that would have made it easier to to do you know youtube and stream content a little a little separately than we do right now um but i mean content wise it's it's all sort of been most dri most driven that uh pretty much the whole thing so i mean when it comes to that uh i'm i'm just along for the uh the ride <laughs> in some ways yeah in a way i don't know i, I don't know it's I, I i've never been a big look back regret wish i'd done things differently kind of person like it's just not part of my nature i i'm more worried about what we can do better tomorrow than what we did wrong five years ago fair enough 
All right. Well, uh, I do have another question from Jeff, but I'll let somebody else get their voice in first. Uh, Rickman33 from the uh, Discord says, how have your gaming preferences or habits changed? Um, and I, well, there's two parts to it. So first off, how have your gaming okay. preferences or habit, habits changed? Well, the big thing is uh, that we have a podcast, right? And we do a show and we're the tabletop bellhop and we need to constantly be playing games to be able to talk about games. And we started working with publishers and reviewing games for publishers, which have a time limit on them. And my entire gaming life pretty much now it revolves around that. So as opposed to, hey, I have a group come over Monday nights and we play RPGs and I have another group come over Friday nights and we play board games and I host an event every Saturday somewhere in Windsor where I just play more games and my decision on what to bring is what do I feel like playing now has completely shifted to what do we need to review? What do we need to get in more plays of? What do I need to try at a different player count? What do I need to try with a different group of gamers? What's the next, uh, when's the Kickstarter going to end? Um, I, it's, it's a business now. It's, it's, I, I have lots of, we have a pile of obligation. It's no longer, no longer the, I'm going to play the games I love that I, I love and I want to play again to what do we have to play next? And sometimes that sucks. Other times I don't mind at all. Like it's, we're back from origins. There's so much of that stuff I'm hyped to play. But then I look at the pile of obligation and now and then there's stuff that like I was excited about when we got it. And it's not that I don't want to play the games, but there's other stuff I want to play so much more. And and much to Deanna's chagrin, we don't get a lot of plays of games we love. Like I'm, I sit in my game room now. I can look around and go, man, I, I would love to said Sean's never played Caverna. It, it's a farming game, but you're also dwarves who explore a mine and the deeper you dive and you can level up. I'm like, Sean would love that game probably as, as he's learned that he likes heavier games more, the more we play them weather machine. We barely gave a chance. Like Sean got us that for Christmas. We should be playing that together just as a group. And you hear we're not instead we're playing what's behind me right now. Oh no, this is stuff we really like. So <laughs> <laughs> instead I, I don't want to cut up a game. I don't want to say something we didn't enjoy. And uh, Deanna brought up Destinies. We were on vacation and we picked up Destinies and I read the rules. That's it. So, like, I I, I feel that that my gaming has changed because it had to. And, and it's not like we're new, the new hotness. We're not one of those podcasts that we're always constantly playing the new thing. But we still have obligations. Like, I, I part of me misses that I just reviewed games I bought because they were cool. But I can't afford that now. I no longer work at the auto industry making a extremely good salary for what I did and only working 40 hours a week. Like, it's just to, to be able to keep doing this, I have to. I don't even know if you heard that, but that was flipping <laughs> loud. Um, My phone hasn't gone off, so I have to assume it's safe to keep recording. <laughs> I, 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 the, the gods are upset at, at, at me talking about review games. But yeah, that's the, the big shit. This became a job. Like, like literally. Yeah. <laughs> see snail runs. It's like, holy crap. Oh, see Deanna's getting alerts on her phone. All right. We are going to pause just for one second to make sure we don't have to like go get the kids up and bring them downstairs here. Yeah, I can hear it. I can hear it outside my, um, I am not seeing any take shelter notifications. Yeah, I haven't gotten... Yes. Our birthday, we get potential tornadoes in Windsor. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, climate change. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything serious. Definitely nasty. So okay. yeah, I mean, I for me, I mean, my 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 board gaming has changed completely. A hundred a hundred percent. I only ever played games with my family and kids, and every once in a while, I'd get together with Mo and play some cool new game that he was really excited about. Um, whereas now we're playing games that we have to play. Uh, and yeah. in many cases, that's fantastic. I'm, I've loved discovering Sorcerer's Arena and all the different deck builders out there. You know, deck builder was a game. It was something I had no idea of. I didn't understand what a deck builder was. Um, and, and now I adore them and, and know that it's, it's really kind of one of my favorite mechanics. Um, but I don't get to play deck builders all the time because we don't always have deck builders to review. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, how we have to, you know, turn down a lot of things, but there are also some things where we probably should have turned them down and didn't, um, yeah. you know, 
uh, this and this is going to allow me to pivot into that next portion of Rickman's question, which is what things have changed in the board game industry. And one of the biggest things is the shift from centralized publishers, you know, a dozen, two dozen major publishers putting out all the games to mm -hmm. anyone and their brother can put out a game. Thank you, Kickstarter, for democratizing yeah. the industry, but also curse you, Kickstarter, for allowing anyone and their brother to put out a game <laughs> regardless of quality. Yeah, that, I would say the biggest change in the industry and in, in the last five years specifically is crowdfunding. And and in some ways it's fantastic. It it, it is it is letting people live their dreams. But there's a reason we no longer do Kickstarter previews, except from established companies who are sending us pretty much complete games. Um, the 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 quality isn't always there, and we are reviewers, not prototype. We're not playtesters. Well, to be fair, we are. I've have playtested games, so has Sean. Um, I've worked with a number of different companies doing playtesting, but that's not <laughs> what we're being asked to do when we get some of these games. So yeah, crowdfunding has changed everything. Like, like it is, it is allowed certain companies like Cool Mini or not, which was a website I have been a member of since 1990 something, where it used to be, here's a picture of a painted miniature and there's the dots at the top where you click one through 10 based on a older website called hot or not, which some of you may remember um, to one of the biggest board game publishers in the world that wouldn't have happened without crowdfunding without Kickstarter specifically. And now it's not just Kickstarter the, and, and, and like itch and drive through RPG as a place to sell PDFs. Like, yes, drive through has been around longer than us, but just the growth of, in Lulu to print books and, the amount of tools out there for someone to publish their own thing now is ridiculous. Literally, pretty much anyone can publish a game. Yeah, and I mean, as just, long with as the you recent, have... just the recent developments of GameFound opening up and BackerKit becoming their own Kickstarter mm -hmm. equivalent, um, it has just been fantastic. Um, it's just come, you know, come out of nowhere. But at the same time, I would really love to uh sit around and and do a a a uh, panel at a con explaining to people who want to just kickstart their game how they should be playtesting their game and more specifically their manuals yeah. because i mm -hmm. am sick to death of getting some of the rule books that we get from or we got because yeah. again we're not doing as many of these now but from Kickstarters, Kickstarter previews for people who have just not figured out how to make a rule book that someone can use. There, there is, a, there is, you have to get past the ego and you have to let your game go. Those seem to be the two big things. People not taking criticism well or taking playtesting advice as actual advice and people who only play the games with their group while they're there to teach people. And they say they blind play tested, but they blind play tested at a con where they were at the table and fix things like, like you're there to go. No, no, not like that. Like this. Oh, that's what that means. Right, right there. You ruin your play test. You're, you're, you're blind. Play test. It's no longer a blind play test. It's, it's a huge issue with newer games. And I'm not even wanted like to get into the the overproduced too many miniatures, blah blah blah. A lot of people like to complain about that. You know what? It works. Yeah, yeah I Those don't even do have a problem. Well. It's not for me, but I think it's a totally. Oh, even valid, then, I'm like, I'd, I'd like Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, like sometimes it is for me. I like miniatures and games. Well, I see. Are, I don't are... even think Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, I'm thinking more of the cool mini or not, where you get like 600 miniatures and and you know that that sort of thing. Horizon Zero Dawn to me isn't as as much of a, a miniature overblown overproduced sort of oh, thing I don't some. Know. Once, once you add in all the expansions and the stack that goes 12 feet high, <laughs> if you backed everything, I think yeah, it does. Fair. I fair. don't think the retail version goes there, but I think the Kickstarter might've. Fair. Yeah. I don't know. Other changes in the industry, the fantastic yet not complete way it has become shockingly more diverse in the last five years. Like, Still like, not it, diverse it, enough. But no, that's what I said. Definitely it's, seen massive it's not there, but it has gotten so much better. Um, I, 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 the industry now better represents the people who buy the games because something Deanna pointed out that was a fantastic point, and I wish I took more pictures is the barbershop bar last Saturday 
is not what the average person thinks when you think who's at a board game night. Yep. There was so much diversity in that building playing games that does not match the the common conception of of who a gamer is. And that was so awesome to see. And we're starting to see that starting to spread into the industry. Because for years, yes, a diverse group of people were playing the games, but a diverse group of people weren't the ones making the games. And it's great to see that expand. And yes, as Sean said, it's not there yet. I don't know if it'll ever be there, but I love seeing the progress that's been made. Absolutely. And even just little things like, you know, going to a con, I, I used to work a lot of conventions, not board game conventions, but just conventions of all sorts generally for my job. And one of the huge uh, changes that has happened in the world is something simple, but that means a lot. And that's the lack of booth babes. Uh, for people yeah. who don't know, maybe who are a little younger, the concept of booth babes was literally you would hire models, escorts, or someone to dress up nice and sexy in your booth to draw people in. Mm -hmm. They weren't employed by the company other than for that booth. They were just literally eye candy to draw people into your booth. Uh, and it was repulsive and it was misogynistic and it has been banned by most organizations, thankfully. Uh, but not seeing that around and seeing the diverse groups of people who are in the booths who are there because they love the games and they want to support the games mm. and sell you the games is just <laughs> fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, another one uh, that will be near and dear to people in the chat room, one in particular, is accessibility in games. Knowing that red and green should not be in the same choice for player colors. Knowing that your resources shouldn't all be the exact same size cubes with the exact same weight. Uh, knowing that the font size of your rule book matters. Um, there, they, there's definitely some room to grow on that still, one. Still a little <laughs> room there. Um, and putting out dual layer player boards, not just because they hold stuff in place beat when a game gets bumped, um, including accessibility things like Braille on games. Yeah. All right. Well, let's kind of jump back to Jeff. And uh, his next question was, what games are there that you wish you could review, but some reason can't justify whether they aren't available, they're hard to review, can't get anyone to play it with? Is there anything out there that you want to review, but just can't or, or, or haven't been able to or haven't figured out how to? All right. Big, big category of gaming. Um, I am looking at four shelves full of role playing games right now to my, my left. Or, that's my right. <laughs> to, to my right. Four shelves of RPGs. Um, we talk about the pile of shame for board games. I don't even want to consider. Um, I did the math the other day. This is kind of impressive. For the pile of shame and obligation, I have not played 6% of the board games I have. That's not bad compared to many people. I don't even want to know. RPGs, I probably haven't played 80%. Or more of the ones I own. And worse, that's just physical books. Um, get into PDFs and <laughs> you can't go over 100, but like it, you might as well say I've never played an RPG in my life if I compare <laughs> how many of my PDFs I played compared to how many. I, we just, the t it, I used to say we don't have the group, but I could probably put together a group. I just don't have the time. Um, which gets back to how has my gaming changed? Our work life balance right now is terrible. Yes, some of the work is playing games and, and socializing. So that part's nice. But like we work ridiculous hours. I can't see setting aside four hours a week to do anything right now without something else falling behind. So role playing games, role playing games is, is the biggest. I would love to play more role playing games and be able to talk about role playing games and review role playing games. Yeah, I would I would love to do. Uh, and again, the big, I think the big thing is Mo's, uh, has adore adoration of in-person RPG. Uh, yeah. and I, I respect that, but at the same time, the world has shifted more towards online RPG groups. Um, and, and there, there's definitely a, a potential. And the other, the other thing is your, your prep, you, you tend to play RPGs that involve significant prep as opposed to masks yeah. where you can sit down and. All right, uh, where were we? All right, okay, let's let's go. 
Um, and so between those two things, it makes it that much harder mm. to RPG. You know, if we were to sit down yep. on some, um, you know, at roll at, dot app or something and play a PBTA game for four hours on a Sunday night, we could probably pull that off, but that's not the kind of RPG that most interests Mo. Um, yeah. You would probably like, play that rather than actually uh, possibly yeah. um, than than D DM it. Maybe I should be running masks for a group. <laughs> the <laughs> problem is, if I, I if I sat at a computer playing a role playing game, I would feel like I'm I'm neglecting work. Right. Which is why I don't play video games on my PC. Is I'm sitting there thinking I could be on Amazon looking up what the latest deals are and I could be sharing a tweet right now or I could be working on the show notes or man, I haven't written an article on the blog in way too long. There's something I'm going to do better this year. I am going to actually publish articles on the blog, not just reviews. That is, that is something I need to do and I'm yet still haven't found the time. And I keep saying, you know, when the, when the, uh, the, the, uh swimming lessons are done then i'll have time it's, that's why i keep saying right when this is done i'll have time and i never do but i do have to get to that um all right well we got uh, i got one more question from the discord and this is from pax and this one is interesting because there's, there's a huge divergence here between mo and i on this one uh and i laughed as soon as as soon as i read the question so who are some of your content creator inspirations who do you look okay. up to and what that's podcasts or youtube channels are at the top of your list. Ah, uh, so the the big ones for me, um, the Dice Tower. Uh, the main reason for the Dice Tower, it's it's not even what I love about the Dice Tower now compared to what it used to be. Is it's not just Tom. I personally have a huge amount of respect for Tom. I generally agree with what he says about games. While we don't have the same taste in games, one of the things Tom is good at is saying what he doesn't like and why it didn't work for him and I can use his reviews to know enough about a game to know if it'd be for me or not. So I appreciate that. What I like more about the Dice Tower is how diverse everyone is and the fact they cover everything. So I can find out something about pretty much every game published every year through the Dice Tower somehow, through one of the members. And for the popular games, I can get two to ten different people's opinions, all from one source. So I greatly appreciate that. Next up would be the Secret Cabal because they're just too damn fun to listen to. Listening to that show, you feel like you're part of the group. That's their whole thing. The Secret Cabal, they're the founders. They founded this private club of gamers who talk about games. And they have such a easygoing vibe that I like listening to that show. Plus, their hype is uh, the, their hype level. They're, they're jumping out of their pants, to use one of their terms. Gets you hyped about games. So they're really up there. Next would be the shows about making games, specifically Ludology. Now, that one's hit or miss for me because they keep changing hosts and they're changing who's talking about games. But they are fantastic for learning about the ins and outs and the insider information. So those are my probably my three biggest inspirations. As for doing the podcast, it was more the Dice Tower and a RPG podcast called... Oh, it's been so long. Happy Jacks. The Happy Jacks RPG podcast was the direct inspiration for the Tabletop Bellhop answering your gaming game night questions. The Dear Abby for Gamers part that is a key to our show. They are a Dear Abby for RPGs. They are a Q&A show where every episode, two to three emails they read off and they discuss as a group. I wanted us to be that. I wanted to be the Happy Jacks for board games. But it just never worked out. The questions we get are very succinct. Hey, give me some games to do this. Or, hey, I'm having this game night problem. They're just not the get a bunch of people sit around a table and discuss it for an hour kind of questions. And I think that's just the nature of RPGs versus board games. So that is a huge inspiration for us is the Happy Jacks RPG podcast, which I'll fully admit I don't listen to anymore because I'm not reviewing RPGs. I'm not playing RPGs. And hearing talk about, you know, how do I fit this character into my game when I'm not playing RPGs just isn't as interesting. So those are probably the big ones, but there are so many more. Uh, the Misdirected Mark podcast the, 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 that I loved for RPG background. Gaming and BS, which I still miss. Uh, Sean and Brett had such a great back and forth. 
those that's another one. Um, there was across the board was one I really enjoyed as a board gaming podcast. I don't even know if they're still around. Uh, I, like I said, the main ones I still kind of keep up with are Secret Ball and Dice Tower because they kind of cover everything. Like to me, it feels like I need to listen to those to have any clue what's going on in the industry. So interesting. Unlike Mo, I don't listen to any gaming podcast. Uh, none. Uh, I, I, I have on occasion listened to Misdirected Mark. Uh, and I did drop in and listen to Sean and Brett's show while they were recording because I like those people. Uh, yeah. But those were RPG podcasts and, and really not essentially at all <laughs> applicable to us. Um, my two biggest inspirations for what this show and my imagination of, of where we were going and what we were doing and what I wanted to do uh, were Smodcast with Kevin Smith and Scott Mosier. Um, mm -hmm. that was kind of my original focus of, you know, two friends talking about stuff. Uh, Kevin and Smith talk, Kevin and Scott talk about movies, games was going to be our sort of thing. Um, and then for a more, uh, sort of technical side, uh, security now with Leo Laporte and Steve Gibson on the Twit, uh, um, the Twit network, it was really my kind of, of once, once we, we had settled into that sort of host and, and expert um balance that we that we found uh and, and as much as that has shifted a little bit nowadays mm, yeah. um that's that's sort of where it 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 originated from was that you know I'm going to be hosting the expert the tabletop bellhop Motisigno uh and that balance is, is something that Leo and Steve do really well in security now and I freely admit that if we do go ahead with the next changes I'm stealing it from that shows <laughs> format uh video format um and then with youtube uh i tend to watch more uh entertaining stuff or you know dude out in the field doing stuff uh right. which has nothing at all to do with what we do so yeah. um that's uh that's completely different all right for for video i did not i i missed the youtube channel part of the question uh rodney smith watch it played i the the best board game teacher out there uh paul grogan's gaming rules also really good sorry paul rodney's just a bit above i think it's mainly because he's canadian um uh and um sorry mental break there where where was uh, rodney teaching videos what am i thinking of there's another one i also like to watch heavy, on heavy, youtube heavy cardboard no no not nothing against heavy card work. I don't watch them on YouTube at all. Um, oh, I I had it and it's gone. I'm I'm sorry, it's completely gone. Who else do I watch on YouTube? Anyway, I, the, the watch it plates are are the big ones I, that I I tend to do the, the the how to learn how to play games. A uh, dice tower, obviously. Um, what I like to watch is like dice tower now, which gives you a heads up. I used to adore board game breakfast, but I don't even know if they still do that. That was a bunch of short segments from a bunch of different people that used to be really good. Um, man, I, I'm trying to think of where I was going. Sorry that I lost it. There was a, oh, um, shut up and sit down because they're just entertaining and informative. Shut up and sit down. Like I, I, I want to be that show but it's not us like we're just not that funny or entertaining or self-defeating enough like it just it's a type of comedy that i can't possibly recreate it's just not in in me to do i greatly enjoy watching shut up and sit downs videos that's the one i've lost fair enough uh have you got your notes open for this next section no you uh, told me i didn't need oh, them okay. so i got rid of them i was going to talk about more games that, that we i want to review we had and i only got to the rpg part sure so i'm going to jump back to jeff's here to get into stuff uh, that we can't review and bring up the big one, Aventuria. We need to play more Aventuria and it needs to be readily available for people to purchase. Uh, the fact it's available on the F shop on Ulysses Spiel just isn't enough. Why is this game not in like mass distribution? Why can't I get it at Cool Stuff or Game Nerds or 401 Games? I would love to be talking about Aventuria every other week because I have enough content to talk about Aventuria, but I hate talking about it because I just get tons of messages of where can I get it? Where can I get it? Where can I get it? Yeah. All right. I will grab the show notes here. So <laughs> what do we had? Uh, okay. This is another one from our discord. Uh, I don't know. You could have read this one off. Right. Um, this is from Pax the Paladin. Uh, one of our biggest fans. Pax hasn't been around. That is Pax in the last year. I think it's longer than that. 
uh, out of nowhere, love packs, uh, brought up uh, about Sean and his role in the show. And this is the reason I don't know if your whole twit <laughs> style is even going to work anymore, because I don't feel that's what our show is anymore. But one of the things that has really developed over the life of the show that they've noticed is how Sean's voice has become more prominent. Not just hosting, but commenting on the talk uh, topics as an authoritative voice. I think it's a great thing. Well, Pax does. I, it's not that I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Who doesn't? Yeah, Pax like, wait, does. that came out weird. <laughs> I think it's terrible. Sean should just be quizzing me. It's my show, not his. Uh, anyway, uh, what Pax loves is the difference in perspectives and experiences between us. And I, and I don't know. I feel like we're losing something in a way that we just it's becoming more homogenous. And you're knowing as much about games as I do. It is. But it's just moving away from our initial goal. Like, I'm like, I want you to enjoy these games as much as me. It's not like I'm like, no, Sean doesn't get to go and come to game nights. We can't talk about this in front of Sean so we can actually ask legit questions once the show gets going. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, again, the initial concept was to have me, a normal, talking to Mo, who's a gamer. Uh, but it's hard not to get more gaming under my belt as we go on and do this. And it's interesting. You know, I was talking about YouTube channels that I watch. And one of them I watch is uh, a uh, food channel from the UK called Sorted. And the initial okay. concept of Sorted was professional chefs who are friends with normals uh, and they work together in the kitchen. Well, they've been doing it now for about five or six years. And now these normals are, while not trained chefs, far more chefy than anyone right. who could ever call themselves a normal. And so while they still do chefs and normals, it has evolved much in the same way ours has just by the fact that these normals are constantly uh, surrounded by the chefy world and chefy ingredients and ways of cooking and things like that. And I think really that's what's happened to me is I, I can't continue being a quote unquote normal around all of this gaming content. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I also do, and I started this a, you know, a lot in part because I wasn't yet in Windsor is while I may not have been able to play the games, um, I love just going out and reading comments and posts, digging through Reddit, mm -hmm. going through the comments on Board Game Geek, which I really don't recommend any normal human do. Um, <laughs> again, the comments in places like that are full of hate and vitriol and, and disgust as much as any comment anywhere. But yeah. being able to put up with that, you can distill out and, and, and push aside some of the disgust and get some real nuggets of truth. So, you know, again, you know, turn turn the volume all the way down on the hate, and, and there's some real honest opinions that come in there once you, you've distilled it out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I find that, that 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 has been, to me, an interesting thing that I have been able to bring uh, about the sort of the public view on games uh, simply by being able to put up with their crap. <laughs> Yeah, I don't tend to go like I, I listen to some gaming podcasts and I get some of their views and I, I follow a lot of content creators on social media. So sometimes get to hear their impressions. But uh, I try not to like before I review a game, listen to a bunch of other people's reviews or go on board game geek to see what people said. I would rather form my own opinion because I don't want to bias. I don't want to sit there and start playing the game and be like, but I know this one strategy is broken. Like, I, I just don't want to do that. I want it to be a fresh view. Now, I used to feel that way about our unboxing videos, but we shifted that. It used to be our unboxings. I wanted you to see the surprise of me opening it. Um, but now I actually do some research before doing the unboxing so that I don't call upon a die. Um, as, as an example, we were shown at Origins. Well, we, and we had a number of, of sort of, you know, people, again, this is, you know, people in the comments who were, you know, calling us out. Uh, and I don't think correctly, but it didn't take a lot of effort to make some of that, uh, some of those changes, uh, and learn about it in, in an upfront. So I think it, it can make some, you lose some of the natural, um, interest and surprise and some of that natural reaction, but yeah. it does lead to a little bit better of an informational, uh, tool, yeah. which is really what we're using it for anyway. Now, what we have started to do is, uh, trying to record me opening up the boxes 
as a like better quality video than me sitting at the end of a podcast trying to hold stuff up at the camera while Sean's using up half the screen. Um, so that's where we're hoping to get that surprise that, oh, my God, look at this. Oh, look how cool it is. So we are we are trying to do that um, as, as something to keep some of that uh, joy of opening something new versus, oh, this is this token that is for this. All right, well, we got one more thing, and Brian brought this up early on in our ask, and I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up this uh, this question session, this informative five-year hangout, and that is, okay. where do you see yourself in the next five years of creating quality hobby board game content? And thank you, Ryan, for considering it quality hobby board gaming content <laughs> there you go. already. I, I honestly, I don't expect things to be all that different. Um, the, my hope is that we have reached a place, um, a better work life balance that of, of better. I am playing some of the games on my shelves. We are playing RPGs. It's not just racing to get the, the five plays in so we can review something before the Kickstarter ends. Uh, the more of a, more of a flow and balance to everything. Uh, we had that in the beginning and somewhere in between it got lost. I think we tried to do too much too quick and, and too much in one week. And maybe we're doing it again, trying to fit in three reviews, some episodes. I, I want to find that balance. The other thing is to make it more financially viable. So we're not scrambling. Some months are tighter than others. So far, we're making this work, but with current inflation, increase in grocery prices and so on, it's getting harder and harder. And unfortunately, the like the affiliate links aren't keeping up with the rate of inflation. <laughs> I have to go on strike and, and demand a better wage. Um, so in five years, I hope to, for one, be able to keep doing this as a living, do this full time. Uh, hopefully living a little more comfortable at the same time with a little more, you know, spending money ability to go to more cons during the year and also to have a little better work balance, work life balance. So that we're not constantly doing something for the bellhop every waking moment and killing an hour every night on the TV. And that's all we do every day. For me, I just want to sort of keep in, uh, increasing our production quality, uh, you know, slow and slow and steady. Uh, you know, every, every little bit counts. We've got a new camera for Mo. And uh, we've got a new, new using Teams now instead of Zooms and little step by step. We've been improving things and finding new ways to do things. Uh, and I just hope to continue that and uh, see where we go from there. So that's it for our five year birthday hangout. Thank you, everyone who joined us here live. And thank you so much for the great questions. If you do have a question for us, that is what we're here for. Again, our goal is to be a dear Abby for gamers. We want you to ask us your game night problems um send in game recommendations uh problems you're having how to plan an event um send it in in a you know sleepless in seattle i have difficulty learning games what's the best way for me to sit down and learn to play games before my friends come over so we're prepared that kind of thing we would love some nice long form questions those can be sent to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or if you don't want to send an email and give us your email address, not that we're going to do anything with it, you could also head to the Tabletop Bellhop webpage at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. That'll give you a form to fill out. And you can put a fake email address in there. We're not going to check. We wouldn't still be here five years in without the help of our Patreon patrons. So tonight we're going to give a shout out to all of them. Ducas, thank you. Evil John, thank you, John. Chris Leary, thank you very much. Valentine Page, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. Ron F., thank you, Ron. Roger Malott, Roger Dodger Games, thank you, Roger. David Miller Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Jeff Sheila and Clara Seuss, thank you. Corey Cat and Clark Domain, thank you. Though Clark's got to start picking up the slack. Brian Van Beek, thank you, Brian. William Fisher, thank you very much. Danielle and Owen Thomas, thank you. Sean P. Kelly, still miss your show. Thanks, Sean. Derek Hisson, thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey, thank you. The Misdirected Mark Podcast, thank you. And Donna, our own Pax the Paladin, thank you so much. And finally, I've got to thank Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Mom. 
This podcast really wouldn't be here without her. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means the party has to come to an end. They're kicking us out of the social room, and we're going to have to lock things up. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I, if you dig the show, if you enjoy what we're doing, one way to keep us here for another five years so we can celebrate our 10th birthday with you is to support us through patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop that's all for us tonight thank you lobbyists for joining us live be sure to stick around for the penthouse suite after show for the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast i'm sean and i'm mo thank you and And game game on. on